Hello. Uh, we now come to the last session of this morning, a uh, plenary talk of geospatial hypercube, automated construction and multidimensional geospatial data analysis. Uh, we have two speakers for this session, uh, Xiao Wen Wang and uh, Zhao Nan Wang also. Um, Xiao Wen, uh, everyone knows him. He wears multiple hats. Uh, first, he's a professor in geogra geography and ge GIS. And in addition to that, uh, of course, he's the director of iGUIDE. Uh, he's also the founding director of uh, Cyber GIS Center. And uh, he's also uh, Associate Dean for Life and Physical Sciences at uh, College of Labor Arts and Sciences at UIUC. Um, and Zhao Nan is a postdoc of Xiao Wen. Um, so I think you two have figured out how to use the 30 minutes. Okay. All right. And you might remember I described a little bit about Hypercube in the beginning talk I gave the yesterday morning. And uh, this is a, a little bit deep dive into what we have been researching. Well, I could start talking about this effort with an eye guide. The idea is, is uh, as I was alluded to from the very brief introduction to this part in my talk yesterday, is uh, you have massive text data and uh, even the large language models such as GPT. Llama and all of this, getting the insights, combining sources of text data to be translatable to understanding, which you could pose questions and generate insights. And of course, it's a still a big question mark how to validate the insights, right? They're not necessarily true, but there's tremendous geospatial insights embedded in such data. And how do we leverage that? and uh, how do we combine that with geospatial inference, reasoning, and analysis. That's what this effort is about. When we started this effort, there was no chat GPT that popular. So you could relate how much we have gone through, and of course, the work at the time we started was not this visible as an activity with an eye guide, but by the time we got some progress, and now generative AI is so um, profoundly disruptive, and this effort is uh, now becoming more timely. Yeah, you could maybe do a demo. So maybe let's get started with a demo and uh, two, well, two bytes. Yeah. You could tell we're really adaptive here. Yeah. You, okay. Yeah, you could. Yeah, we, we'll figure out the uh, slide deck and uh, let's get started with a demo to get you get a um, like basic understanding how this um, Android spatial knowledge hypercube really like put in the practical use. And Shaoben are gonna talk about the kind of the underlying mechanism of the geospatial knowledge hypercube. Yeah. All right, so today we, we have a tremendous amount of uh, geospatial knowledge in a hidden uh, massive volume of text data. So a question arises naturally that what are these uh, news talk about and also where those news talk about. So this introduces our web application of a prototype system uh, for the geospatial knowledge hypercube with a unique capability for um, combining text and also geospatial data and analytics. So let's get started with uh, uh, about page, so which tells us what hypercube is and uh, why it's important. So it's introduced it's a um, novel data architecture which um, basically um, performs automatic and multi-dimensional information retrieval task from unstructured information like uh, text data, uh, news articles, uh, micro blogs, and uh, um, academic papers to into a structured data representation, so which are gonna further facilitate the um, downstream tasks 
such as uh, geospatial and geointelligent applications. And uh, currently it's a, a, a kind of a prototype version. It's uh, in constant um, improvement. And now let's dive in. Uh, here we get a bunch of uh, news articles, like what we see every day, a large pool like of uh, um, what's going on uh, in the world. So what we're, we're going to do is basically that we have a pre-trained language model on the back end, and we construct the knowledge hypercube to organize the uh, information. And the, we are going to firstly dive into the first application, which are powered by the topic dimension of the um, geospatial knowledge hypercube. So basically, uh, let's see we are interested in four major topics, uh, infrastructure, environment, politics, and economy here. How the, uh, how the model um, works is basically what we are just uh, train the model. It's based on a just um, a list, a set of um, label names with a minimized uh, supervision so that we get infrastructure. Um, we just let the model know the uh, four keywords and the model automatically uh, look for some semantically similar or um, contextualized um, which, which uh, information to kind of represent the similar um, semantics of infrastructure uh, environment. Let's take this environment as an example. It finds, um, based on from a big training corpus, the model will find ecosystem, wildlife, vegetation, and the next step the model does is basically use, let's say, the environment um, seed words to ma do a matching into the newses. Let's see, the first news um, gets uh, environment hurricane, which are matching, um, which are matched based on the uh, set of key, uh, seed words. And when the uh, when the matching goes over a certain amount of uh, threshold, uh, the model will automatically assign or cluster the uh, label to the uses. And the uh, function of this topic dimension is basically help us um, zoom in and filter the huge pool of uh, news we see every day so that we can zoom into whatever uh, topic we are interested in. So let's see, we are interested in aging dams um, problem. And we can see dam, it's kind of a, a major C word here. And uh, the next um, major like um, use case of the geospatial knowledge hypercube is that we are further focused on the other dimensions of the hypercube, basically temporal and geospatial. And let's check it out. And here, this news talk about a dam failure event in Michigan. And we, we can see there are the multiple entities, such as a temporal entity like date, time, geospatial entity like uh, location, organization, and facilities are recognized from the raw text, and they are also pinpointed onto a map. And this direct linkage between text and geospatial map actually facilitates the um, user to understand the geospatial context of the um, recognized geo-entities. And let's see, we click onto um, the geo-entities, this Edinburgh Dam, and the, this map will be automatically zoomed in to the geospatial context of this place. And also um, the other and uh, geo-entities. If we click on the markers, we can see, um, well, we've, we've been implementing this um, buffer analysis tool to help the user understand the geospatial context of the geo-entity, recognize the geo-entities, which are actually, we can see, are filtered uh, based on the uh, raw text. So it, it's, we, we are doing kind of this two level of zooming in from a large pool of corpus into the specific, 
fake topics and then to the Android entities we care about. In this case, this Edinburgh Dam, where the uh, failure happened, and how it's gonna impact the um, populated areas, so such as some uh, local high schools and the malls. So, and the current stage, we've been also for, um, supporting this exploitation tool to get the recognized drill entities and their coordinates output into a JSON file, which even supports it, uh, other possibilities and usage on other platforms. I think that's what we've been uh, currently have and uh, also exploring some more spatial analysis tools, such as uh, uh, we're doing this uh, distance uh, matrix so that we can get the route of any pair of origin destinations um, on the network distance. So well, actually, so the potential of this dual spatial knowledge hypercube is not limited to this demo. Uh, let's see, in the next step, we can combine the temporal dimensions, like the date and the time, with the geo entities to further visualize this process of the event with uh, some like uh, a storytelling map, so that the um, users and decision makers can better understand the process uh, progression of this event. That's the end of this um, demo, and. Uh, yeah, I'll give the stage back to Shaolin. We can switch into the slide deck. Wow, magically. Now it's my job to demystify what Zhao has done. <laughs> so we have flipped the script. Thank you again, Zhao uh, And sorry about this uh, adaptation we had to do on the fly. As uh, you see now from the First of the slide, this is a, a teamwork, and John and I are here, but uh, we're really uh, presenting the work on behalf of a, a larger team, and uh, the leader, in fact, is a computer science professor at UIUC, Jia Wei Han, and uh, he is not able to come here for the forum, and uh, also the collaborators, uh, Manu Lau, as I mentioned on the first day, he. Uh, is not able to come as well, but you saw Jack, uh, the, his pictures there, looking into the interdependence, right, across distances and the impacts. The kind of story John was telling, coming from this idea of telecoupling, and that's the angle we're using to uh, assess how these interconnected relationships are getting uncovered from our analysis, as well as a couple of social scientists at uh, Utah State University, Corning Flint is a sociologist. Again, there are quite a few folks, but on the top row, I do think we have multiple folks here. I know Bowen is somewhere, perhaps it's hard for me to tell, as well as Wei, uh, who are graduate students, uh, together with Eric Lee, um, a research programmer at the CyberGS Center. So yeah, kudos to all of you. Um, and the outline here is, uh, what is the design? Uh, we are putting together and how do we achieve this automated analysis based on the representation of the cube. And uh, the demo you already saw, now I'm doing my part to demystify what's happening uh, behind the scene and also our work published to back up this system prototype and uh, of course ongoing and uh, future work. So the idea here is really now you already saw examples, right? Collections of news media data. And is there massive? We only had now a small set filtered already for this demo purpose you saw from Jonah. Now, how do we leverage large language models, which is in the back end uh, we are using? And I'll give you a little more specifics about that. And then conduct this uh, combination of geospatial context and the context embedded in text data. Essentially, what Jonah was doing, zoom in and out in the text space as well as in the geospatial space. And then what is the role of this knowledge hypercube? Because this is a high dimensional space. How do you slice and dice from the text data coming from all kinds of sources and really use 
space as our organization lens of looking at the complex uh, interactions and uh, interconnected relationships. So uh, even the same example, such as uh, the Anvil Dam, as you saw earlier, I think from the advances of AI and machine learning, a major philosophy here for us is to minimize human labeling work. And we know that is expensive, even from the earlier talk you heard, for instance, the urban change detection. In order to have the ground truth to validate and to give the training support, this is not a low-cost process. Now, from our computer science research perspective, we want to lower that barrier. This is a weak supervised learning or even no supervised learning is what we're trying to push toward. And then, how do we do this? Well, you have to establish a structure because uh, for unstructured data, if you have to learn from scratch, you need human labeling work and inputs. But if you introduce structure into such data, and then you have a major leverage to reduce that cost of labeling and training. So that's what we're getting to. We have this dimensions of space and time and attributes associated with the space and time to reduce this cost of learning and the interaction with the large language, language models. So it's a human-guided design, essentially. How do we leverage common sense knowledge from humans for the construction of the cube? And uh, so there is this input you already have got by what Jonah has demonstrated because we give the infrastructure environment dimensions to the cube to work with, to begin with, right? And the space time are given dimensions. So these are not negotiable. The cube has to begin with. And then, of course, the attributes and the entities, we do have to give some initial labels associated with those major dimensions and have the categorization in place. So automatic text classification. And uh, entity recognition is important because in order to extract geo references and entities, you need that part into the interaction with the large language models, which is not an easy process in order to scale to large corpus. So now this is getting a little bit into more technical and uh, for those of you who are working with large language models, BERT is a sort of a more pluggable and adaptable version of those bigger models, which tend to be harder to work with for such an experimentation. And then how do you achieve unclassified classification? Not unclassified, unsupervised. Sorry, classification on top of this architecture, is this what diagram is trying to demonstrate? And there's a paper published a couple of years ago illustrating this methodology. Now, plugging into our use case, you saw the example again from the demo, the watershed and dam as our targets and uh, name entity recognition, recognition and labeling. Just how do you carve out these terms? And I'll show you some concrete examples. It's pretty amazing because you actually don't need these terms to detect the similar terms actually having the same meaning. So this is the notion of filtering. Again, how do you do this in weakly supervised fashion? And a paper listed on the, at the bottom of the previous slide. So let's say, our dimension of impact on human, uh, which is sort of uh, the example of Zhang Nan demoed. So documents touching upon this impact on human aspects are automatically classified into human. So you look at these sentences, even if they're not seemingly talking about a human, our methodology is able to pick them up as addressing humans. So that's really the power we're pursuing to be able to understand the text information. And more specifically, related to geospatial terms, right? Watershed, dams. Again, if you look at those highlighted sentences, they may not be even obvious to humans. They're talking about dams and watershed. But again, through this 
labeling name entity recognition approach, we are actually able to pick them up through machine learning to be able to achieve this understanding. They are actually addressing these geospatial aspects. So uh, let's say just a, a quick example. For instance, the uh, watershed there, you know, the first sentence basically was talking about a lake and it's not really about watershed. If we, you, you know, human beings are reading, we need the context information to, to detect that. But uh, the AI approach here through the integration with the large language models could actually achieve pretty decent performance uh, with you know, precision that we call. This is, of course, numerical. You only need to appreciate that together with the examples like this, right? Otherwise, they are very abstract metrics. So applications beyond, for instance, the dam. The example Zhang Nan showed, we're looking at, for instance, emergency response and also telecoupling. Look at things that are remotely connected but not obvious so that we could discover hidden linkages. These are the kinds of problems normally you would have a hard time to gather data for. And it's a potentially powerful use case for this framework. And of course, the data you saw from the demo was largely from news media. Text data is coming from literature as well, from social media as well. So it's uh, to me and to our group, it's really hidden treasure. I mean, they're noisy. They, of course, literature is not necessarily noisy, but uh, you know, news media and the social media, they're noisy. And the purpose of collecting a lot of this data, of course, is not intended necessarily for the kind of analysis and the scientific work we're interested in. So how do we repurpose this? And how do we evaluate the quality of, quality of such data? For instance, a major next step we're pursuing is to conduct network analysis as these geo-entities are established to see how things are linked uh, across space and time. So the system you already saw Again, how do we achieve this through weekly supervised training and uh, how do we minimize the labeling work? Uh, that is a frontier in computer science research these days. That's why you saw multiple papers published at the top computer science conferences. Well, you already saw this. <laughs> uh, so I was trying to uh, demystify and uh, I would not get you bored since I'm um, between you and lunch. Uh, but uh, in case you want to get into more technical details for the construction of Hypercube, this is a really a collection of related methodologies. And uh, for the Hypercube itself, if you are going to the ACM 6 Special Conference, we have a demo paper there. And uh, that will be another opportunity for us to share with you uh, the internal workings of the Hypercube. But uh, feel free to corner Zhao Nan, Wei, I think somewhere in the room, and the Bowen, these are the technical insiders really knowing uh, the intricacies of the components we are combining and integrating to form the system. And uh, of course, relation extraction now is a major piece of our work because uh, that is pointing us to the next steps for important knowledge discovery uh, is, is about relation among the entities with the geolocation references. And uh, another big next step, as I said, especially related to our work on telecoupling is network analysis. How could we construct networks and uh, combine the networks from the text data with the networks from the geospatial data? So ongoing research continue to improve our hypercube construction methodology and minimize labeling work because that's costly, especially for large corpus, almost infeasible if we're imagining the kind of large-scale analytical work we, accomplish, we hope to accomplish. And uh, introduce to the best degree possible geospatial knowledge into the cube construction, just like we introduce the major dimensions for the cube construction, because that's the knowledge text data doesn't have inherently. This is the part why we challenge the large language models like ChatGPT, simply because they don't have 
geospatial understanding. We have to give that understanding to these models. And uh, for real world problems as we are motivated for, and uh, that's solution-based thinking, right? How could we really get new insights out of this uh, advanced uh, AI capabilities? So the prototype system is uh, updated regularly with the new features and uh, applications in diverse domains and we're as also next step to make this available through our iGUIDE platform. And uh, we're looking for opportunities to collaborate with you in case you are also looking at the intersection between text data based geospatial understanding and geospatial understanding from other more traditional sources of geospatial data. How do we combine these two streams of um, digital insights and knowledge discovery pipelines. That's really the key motivation for this work. Thank you.